I am uh, <clears throat> going to read some pages from uh, Henderson the Rain King to you, and then um, I'm going to um, talk to you, answer some of your questions. Now, I wrote this book, um, I think it was 1957 or 58. And I was living in an old house in, uh, in Dutchess County, New York, near the Hudson River. And life was uh, particularly difficult at that time. And I do mean difficult. And um, my publisher said that he couldn't wait any longer for this manuscript. He had to have it. And I told him it wasn't ready. So he said that he would send a typist down and I could just dictate the book to her. And she would take it down directly on the, on the typewriter. Um, and she came out and she said um, that she was perfectly happy to do this, but that she didn't uh, cook, shop, or make beds. So I did the cooking and the shopping and I made the beds and the washing after dinner. Uh, and then I would sit down and prepare my next day's dictation. So um, the harder things got, the funnier I felt. Okay, I haven't looked at this myself in many years. <clears throat> what made me take this trip to Africa? There is no quick explanation. Things got worse and worse and worse, and pretty soon they were too complicated. When I think of my condition at the age of 55, when I bought the ticket, <clears throat> all is grief. The facts begin to crowd me, and soon I get a pressure in the chest. A disorderly rush begins. My parents, my wives, my girls, my children, my farm, my animals, my habits, my money, my music lessons, <clears throat> my drunkenness, my prejudices, my brutality, my teeth, my face, my soul. I have to cry, no, no, get back, curse you. Let me alone. But how can they let me alone? They belong to me, they're mine and they pile into me from all sides. It turns into chaos. <clears throat> However, the world which I thought so mighty an oppressor has removed its wrath from me. But if I am to make sense to you people and explain why I went to Africa, I must face up to the facts. I might as well start with the money. I am rich. From my old man, I inherited three million dollars after taxes. But I thought myself a bum <clears throat> and had my reasons. The main reason being that I behaved like a bum. But privately, when things got very bad, I often looked into books to see whether I could find some helpful words. And one day I read, the forgiveness of sin is perpetual and righteousness first is not required. This impressed me so deeply that I went around saying it to myself. But then I forgot which book it was. It was one of thousands left by my father, who had also written a number of them. And I searched through dozens of volumes. But all that turned up was money, for my father had used currency for bookmarks, whatever he happened to have in his pockets, five, tens, or twenties. Some of the discontinued bills of 30 years ago turned up the big yellowbacks. <clears throat> For old time's sake, I was glad to see them, and locking the library door to keep out the children, 
I spent the afternoon on a ladder <clears throat> shaking out books. <laughs> and the money spun to the floor. But I never found that statement about forgiveness. Next order of business about forgiveness. Next order of business. I am a graduate of an Ivy League university. I see no reason to embarrass my alma mater by naming her. <laughs> if I hadn't been a Henderson and my father's son, they would have thrown me out. At birth, I weighed 14 pounds, and it was a tough delivery. Then I grew up six feet, four inches tall, 230 pounds, an enormous head, rugged with hair like Persian lamb's fur, suspicious eyes, usually narrowed, blustering ways, a great nose. <clears throat> I was one of three children and the only survivor. It took all my father's charity to forgive me, and I don't think he ever made it altogether. When it came time to marry, I tried to please him and chose a girl of our own social class. A remarkable person, handsome, tall, elegant, sinewy, with long arms and golden hair. Private, fertile, and quiet. None of her family can quarrel with me if I add that she is a schizophrenic, <laughs> for she certainly is that too. I also am considered crazy, and with good reason. Moody, rough, tyrannical, and probably mad. To go by the ages of the kids, we were married for about 20 years. They are Edward, Ricey, Alice, and two more. Christ, I got plenty of children. <laughs> God bless the whole bunch of them. It's just a sample. And if you'd like to ask me some questions, I'd like to answer them. What historical events influenced you? Well, the first was my birth. That was a great influence. <laughs> <laughs> the second was World War I, because I was born during the First World War. <clears throat> and I had an old Aunt Jenny who couldn't sing, uh, couldn't speak English properly, and she would sing songs to me about World War I songs, pack up your troubles in your old kit, beg and smile, or it's a long way from Tipperary and things like that. So, <clears throat> so that was an influence on me, surely. <clears throat> then I, um, I was a child during the period of Amer Great American Prosperity, the age of uh, Harding and Coolidge. Then there was the Great Depression, um, <clears throat> which was terrible, but also very um, inspiring. Um, you found out about life during the Depression. I was on the WPA. <clears throat> and then there was the Second World War, and so on. Yes? When you think of you as a great writer, how do you think of yourself? I think of myself as a working stiff. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> if I got up in the morning and uh, say, say to myself, well, great writer, What's go what's gonna, what are you going to do today? I'd be paralyzed. So I duck the whole thing. And um, <clears throat> I don't much enjoy being a celebrity. There, um, I didn't want to be ignored or passed over. That but if, you what? Is that why you wrote? To be no, no, no. No, I wanted my books to be read. Um, no, I didn't write in order to be a celebrity. It, at that time, it never even entered your mind. <clears throat> it was the Depression period. And really, there was no point in preparing for, a, for uh, a profession, because dentists and lawyers and engineers were uh, on the soup line. Um, <clears throat> so my father asked me what I wanted to do. <clears throat> and at first, I ducked him. I said that I would, I would like to study anthropology, which he had never heard of. <clears throat> but that was just a front, because what I really wanted to do was write. So as I say, I didn't want to be ignored. I didn't want my books to be ignored. But I didn't really care to be such a, um, to cut such a figure either. Because, um, well, 
it interferes with the business of writing. <clears throat> it does give you a certain amount of confidence so that you've, <clears throat> before you, you, you would say anything you damn please, but you did it defiantly. Now I say anything I damn please and I do it with confidence. <laughs> Yeah, I do. I, when I finish something, I generally put it on the shelf, <clears throat> and I very seldom look at it unless somebody mentions it to me. And then I open the book, and I read it, and I say, did, that, did I do that? <clears throat> That's not bad. Or, if I had it to do over again, I'd throw it out and start from scratch. My reaction today was not bad. Uh, the main character in the passage you just read was a very large man, and I assume that about yourself. No. <laughs> at the time you were writing it, was it inspired or were you looking at it more as a task that you must complete? Oh no, I was all stirred up. Were you, you were sort of a brainchild at the time? Yeah. Well, you see, Dutchess County was full of, uh, full of more eccentrics than you could shake a stick at. And, um, and I got to know and like some of them very much. Um, and so I put together my own eccentric from available parts. <clears throat> and, uh, and that got me started. Um, and I was enjoying it, really. I, and I don't like to write from a, from, a, from a flat, cold position. You must either like what you're doing very much or like the people, either like them or hate them. You can't be indifferent. Uh, the Penn Conference, that's a, a, a conference, international conference of writers. <clears throat> they came from every part of the world. And, uh, and I said something in defense of American democracy, so I got jumped on. <clears throat> um, but I, I still believe that, uh, I, 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 I said this, this was not a land of perfect justice, but um, and I, and I had nothing to say about America as a superpower. I made that clear. But I thought that, um, like Churchill, I thought this was the worst form of government except for all the others. <coughs> so uh, so I, I had a fight on my hands. It was curious, yes. What kind of books do you read for fun? Well, mainly I read books I've read, I've read before because I'm sure of getting fun out of them. Ah, well, I read Dickens, and I read um, um, Mark Twain, and I read um, Faulkner, among modern writers, and I read uh, Dostoevsky, and uh, <clears throat> I read Shakespeare, often. Do you consider them your peers? You mean, do I consider myself their peers? No, I'm afraid not. When you read them, you consider yourself reading the greats? Oh, well, I'm so stirred up, I'm glad to be able to uh, understand them if that's what I'm doing. Were there any other autobiographical events that occurred that were inserted into the book? <laughs> well... <laughs> well, I was never the father of twins. <clears throat> I, um, I have three children, but they were born one at a time, thank you. <clears throat> and um, I was never married to a girl like Lily, and I never owned an estate in the Hudson Valley. You don't seem that eccentric or anything in some of these things you put on. I don't seem that eccentric? Well, I certainly wouldn't do it here. <laughs> No, <clears throat> things that you write are in some degree autobiographical, but the first thing you find out about autobiography <clears throat> is that it's the hardest thing in the world to write. It's hard because it's so very difficult to be absolutely factual about yourself. <clears throat> so that um, when you write, you may draw on facts from your own life, but if they're not in harmony with your story, they're worse than useless. You just stumble over them. So you have to 
have a sound judgment <clears throat> and eliminate the ones that don't fit. <clears throat> because every, every book, every story, has a sort of invisible musical signature at the front. And when you've written the first few lines of a story, those govern all the rest that follows. And <clears throat> if there's no harmony between those openings, between the opening and what comes subsequently, and then you're just on the wrong track, and people won't read you because you can't carry their interest. The difficult and most pleasurable for you about writing? Well, the most difficult thing is the, is the occasional uh, panic, doubt that you have that maybe you're not going to be able to finish your project. <clears throat> and the most um, desirable is um, is when you're either uh, laughing or weeping yourself and uh, scribbling at the same time. Uh, when you're turned on that way. Um, that's what one lives for in this trade. Well, that's a good question. Um, I don't mean the others weren't good, they were all good. <clears throat> What happens is that when you're reading something that stirs you, uh, you begin to imitate it unconsciously. Just as when I was a kid and I, I had seen a Tarzan movie, I would go home swinging through the trees <laughs> if, if I could manage it. So that when I read uh, Hemingway or Sherwood Anderson or somebody else like that, very influential in my, in my early years, I would find myself uh, composing in the same manner. I'd find myself making up sentences. It was hot. We went down in the street. I sat down in a cafe. The waiter came. I ordered a pair no. <clears throat> it was terribly hot. I went up to my room. I couldn't breathe, so on. Well, you fall into that, you see. And um, it's a kind of monkey shines. It's a very amusing. Um, but it's also a test of your skill. Uh, to, uh, to do a good uh, imitation. Later on, you forget all about these imitations. Later on, you feel that you have, you've developed your own skills. And those skills are based on your own voice, which today is giving out. <clears throat> um, your own natural, original tone, which is what what's, provides the engine for what you're writing. A great English poet named William Blake uh, said, opposition is true friendship. Meaning, uh, um, when, uh, when, when so many people are down on you, it's a good time to learn something from them. And the Bible says, woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. That's where the critics come in. <coughs> because they don't speak well of you, often. But, uh, you, can take, you have one of two choices. Either you can panic again and uh, start um, making uh, frantic attempts to reform under, this, under the glare of this, these awful critical eyes. Or you can just say, the hell with you. Uh, I know what I'm doing. If you don't yet, it's because you haven't given me an attentive reading. You have to balance these things between the attentive reading and the self-doubt. In answer to your first question, I think both optimism and pessimism are, are very boring outlooks. Uh, I, I, I like to know what's going on, and I like to tell myself that I can handle the worst should my observations uh, prove to be uh, negative or unfavorable. I, I see a great many things now that I, that I couldn't see when I was a, a young person, and I don't like everything that I see. For instance, I see people spending about 50 hours a week in front of the TV, <clears throat> which means that there is, there are, they have no more family life. Uh, they belong to, um, to the crowd, so to speak. They belong to the media. Um, and they have no individual perspective. They derive their observations. They get them ready-made from somebody who packages them 
And I don't think that's a very good thing for anybody. As for my loss of hope, I can't say that that's true, e that's true either, because when I'm, when I'm ready to uh, throw up my hands in despair, I generally meet some f uh, first-rate people, so uh, I back away from that. <clears throat> As for willing, uh, winning a Nobel Prize, <clears throat> well, at first it was very agreeable. Uh, you, wear, uh, you wear a claw hammer coat and a white tie, and you, uh, you, you're the king and the queen shake your hand. You dine in a palace, and uh, you feel a little bit like Cinderella. But then 20 people burst into your bedroom with cameras in the morning <laughs> before you've gotten out of bed or brushed your teeth or anything else, uh, and, you've, and you, uh, you realize that you're no longer your own master. That once you have received an honor like this, the public takes you to be its property, in a way. The only remedy is to hide from this, which is what I'm doing in Chicago. <laughs> Where occasionally when I give a sales clerk a credit card, she says, uh, or he says, um, didn't you win in the Olympics about, <laughs> <laughs> about 20 years ago? And I said, yes, I was a swimmer. <laughs> which is a prize I would just as leaf have won. To drown? Oh, just in tears. Just drowning in grief. Oh, yes. He went on, went on weeping. You, you need to survive to continue weeping. Sure he did. <clears throat> Incidentally, um, Mr. Robbins didn't tell you that uh, Seize the Day has just been made into a film. And uh, I haven't seen the film, so I can't recommend it. But I've read the book, and it was very good. <laughs> when you read interpretations of your work, do you ever find that people read more significantly than something that you had intended to read? Do I find that people read more significance into what I wrote? Yes, indeed. I, said, I didn't mean that, uh, I say to myself. But it's a good idea. <laughs> uh, no, uh, sometimes I'm baffled uh, when I uh, hear people's impressions of what I've written. <clears throat> and I say to myself, you always assumed you were a part of the human species. How come you can get yourself so completely screwed up and misunderstood? Um, the answer is uh, that people sometimes put on their thinking caps when they're reading a book and they feel this is a serious book by a serious writer. I'm a serious reader, and I must give this a serious reading. And the result is that they generally miss um, the comedy and humor of the book by being so very serious. Um, when I wrote Herzog, everybody raised a cry, saying uh, <clears throat> Bellow is the intellectual's writer. On the contrary, I was poking fun at the intellectuals, and I was showing how uh, much a, um, a, a long university education culminating in a PhD could do to disorient you, <laughs> so that you couldn't handle the ordinary crises of life. As I was poking fun at all these letters of Mr. Herzog, but the critics assumed that they were taking some six-hour comprehensive examination at the University of Chicago, <laughs> which, they had to be, uh, which they had to pass or be booted out. Do you write just to be funny, or do you want to make, or do you want people to laugh and then think about what you've written? Well, no, uh, uh, being funny for its own sake is very estimable. It's a nice thing. Um, if you continue to be very funny, Persist, if you persist in it, then you turn into a crank, like any other crank. Because you become clever and you're always uh, alert for an opportunity to make another crack. And, uh, and then you become silly. Uh, there has to be measure in these things. And the, 
the humor has to be your humor. It's got to be natural to you and without strain. So, um, wit is a very good thing, but persistent cleverness in wit uh, can be um, very boring, trying to people. You, you know, you... <clears throat> One of the things that I was always persuaded of as a writer was that you had to give some uh, happiness to the people who were reading your books. It didn't have to be frivolous happiness. You might be writing about a murderer. But still, some kind of delight in the <coughs> book. And I took it as an obligation. So you don't want people to think that there's some deep meaning under, about the world and we live in under the human. Well, I want people to think it if it's there. But, <clears throat> but only I can guarantee that it's there. If I can't guarantee it, I don't want them to do anything except pass it over as quickly as possible. But usually I can vouch for it because I've, I've been there. So I can, I, can I can give my assurances that it's okay to take it seriously. Are your books written in stream of consciousness? Like that, you well, that wasn't stream of consciousness. That was just a first person singular. It wasn't really... Well, it's freewheeling, but it's not stream of consciousness, because stream of consciousness is involuntary. Uh, it's what uh, your mind gives you when you're not, um, when you're not um, <clears throat> applying volition. At my, at my age, um, you have a mind like a trunk with, uh, where you can always rummage and come up with something interesting. Uh, and you have all kinds of projects in the trunk or in the attic um, or in the belfry. <laughs> and, uh, but you don't write them just because you have them. You have to be... You, you can't just go from the idea to the page. You have to be stirred by the idea. Just because it's a good idea doesn't mean that you're going to write it. I've had many good ideas, <clears throat> which I've had to ignore, because I didn't feel um, any desire to write the thing. So <clears throat> more important than an outline is the desire. But I don't knock an outline. It may be very useful. I don't use it. I think it was, it's, I, I do like it because it is a sort of a, of a hang loose, funny book. If, if you read it with the accents in the right places, um, and it's nothing at all if you don't read it with the accents in the right places. <laughs> I have seen my books on the bargain table. And I've been ple very pleased because uh, the bargain table is usually where I buy books myself. Uh, do I uh, look at once to see um, my books on the shelf? No. Um, I usually skip the A's and the B's altogether. It makes me uncomfortable to see the books on the shelf. Um, uncomfortable because I can no longer correct the mistakes I know are there. I've missed my chance. I think that's what most writers think of when they, when they see their finished books. They, they say, uh, if only on page 38, paragraph 2, <clears throat> I hadn't made uh, that dismal mistake. So you <clears throat> hardly see anything else when you pick up your, one of your own books. Okay, th thank you all.